who's been on the road touring with the Alabama Shakes. So excellent keyboard player. I love your your style of play. Oh, thanks, man. Because um, it, it fits within that realm of playing what needs to be there. And when you step out to show out or shine a little bit, it's purposeful. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, when I when I moved back, so I grew up playing piano from the time I was like six and took lessons, and then when I was like in junior high and high school, thought it wasn't cool anymore and switched more to like guitar and bass and was doing that and playing in bands all through high school and college, mostly on guitar and some on bass. And then, but I always kind of kept up the piano chops a little bit. And then when I moved back here, I kind of really thought of myself more as a guitar player, but I very quickly decided, you know, discovered that there were a lot of really good guitar players around here. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not a guitar player. I can't, I'll, I will never, I'm never going to get past these folks. Even the guys who were just like the songwriters at fame, which looking back now, it was a lot of like r- real amazing players because it was just like james leblanc oh he's an incredible guitar player jason isbel yeah even i mean dylan was only like 16 at the time but he was already really good and it's just like i can't play like these dudes but i just sort of not really it wasn't like a conscious thing just sort of playing more keys and would play on sessions sometimes especially if it was just like a little organ overdub or something it's just like don't hire somebody i can do that you know if you want something really specific or fancy you might need to hire somebody but if you're just wanting something simple i can do it and then from that just started playing in bands around town and before long i was playing in like six bands just because there was there wasn't another keyboard player sort of in our generation really there's yeah what there wasn't anybody else so i kind of just became the default keyboard player for our group of friends and that was really what led to meeting the shakes and and playing with them was just sort of intersected with them and they were looking for a touring keyboard player and once we got to know each other it's just like yeah that makes sense and it kind of began just as yeah just give me your give me your dates and i'll play whenever i can and they were kind of the same way just like yeah play with us whenever you can and then um that was like summer 2011 kind of fall of 2011 is when things started to really um, pick up and then that first record came out in 2012 and it was kind of off to the races after that right but it wasn't really my ambition to tour i love it it's cool like it's super cool like right after i left fame i was touring a good bit with dylan leblanc like in his band and then sometimes he and i we did a handful of tours just duo like if he was opening for somebody so i had a little bit of touring under my belt already with him and with some other bands but that was more like dylan's was all over like all over the country and some in europe and then most of the other bands were just kind of you know regional southeast maybe do an east coast run like to new york but it was never more than like a week or two kind of stuff mostly until the shakes thing and then when i first started playing with them i had like way more touring experience than any of them and was kind of the person with the past experience and like we were playing a lot of venues i'd played before and things like that but it very quickly outstripped my experience (laughs) after about like six months we were doing things and playing places where i was just like i have no idea what's going on (laughs) that had to be extremely valuable though to those guys because they had someone experience because i mean that that, it seemed like it just snowballed really quickly for them and once it hit a level of success it was just like they were everywhere and that had to be extremely valuable and probably comforting in some degree to have you that had at least been there in some way before them yeah i think i think so a little bit like um, going playing some venues they've never been at. Yeah, or just like, at. you know, your first time playing like a festival or something where it's just like you don't know how it's going to work. Right. But having somebody around who's done it and it's been like understands. It's kind of the same thing we we're talking about with the studio. Of like there's a lot of touring stuff as far as like load ins and sound checks or changeovers and all this stuff that you take it for granted once you've done it for a little while. And but then you realize like if people haven't done it, it's not just you don't just wake up knowing that stuff. Right. Uh, you got to learn it. So what's it like having been on some Grammy winning stuff? It's cool. I mean, has that helped you at all with like, hey, I have a Grammy. Come work with me. (laughs) I don't think so. I guess it doesn't hurt. I mean, the the Grammy thing's kind of. I have mixed feelings about it because it's nice. It's an awesome paperweight. Yeah, right. I would love to have one. Uh, But you know, my my real my joke is that now that I have one. It's worth a lot less. Yeah, you know, it shows you what a Grammy's worth. They'll give one to anybody. Um, <laughs> well, but, but I also don't, don't demean it like that, though. I mean, because yeah. you deserve it. I, I mean, mean, I think you, you guys, you guys definitely deserve it. But also, I can definitely understand what you're saying. Where it's like, okay, what's next? 
Yeah, you know, and that, there's that's just definitely like, not it's your not life the, goal. Exactly. Yeah, that was never a goal. Yeah, because I had an experience where I didn't realize at the time where it was a lot more easy to get on the ballot of yeah. like the the whole the, uh, the long list. You can yeah, and that happened like three or four or so times for me, and I'm like, whoa, holy crap, that's kind of cool. Then several friends have either been nominated or won. And yeah. It's like, oh, wow, that's there's, a little more attainable than I thought. There's been a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, totally. And then I had this thought of like, okay, if I did get nominated for something like that and won, then what? Exactly. What? I need bigger goals, man. Right, right. But yeah, my goals were never for that. But it's cool. And it's nice. Like with the Shake stuff, you know, when I, when I first saw them play, before I started playing with them, they really blew my mind. It was like one of the... It was at the Flying Monkey in Huntsville with oh, oh that's a cool place. Flying. Forty or forty or fifty people. It was like the bands playing to each other and their friends and family, like like a lot right. of the gigs we've played. But they were really unbelievable and it but I never thought it would be big. I just thought this band is incredible and I wanna play with them. You were just digging it. Yeah, just like, loved I, it. I I wanna be a part of this. Yeah, and it's been kind of vindicating and validating to like see it become big because before that I'd been fans of lots of bands and and, and played in lots of bands that I thought were really good but it's so rare that it actually comes together and happens so it's been validating to see it the way it's unfolded that it's still at least it's still very difficult and it still takes no matter how good you are it takes an unbelievable amount of luck and sort of circumstance to be in the right place at the right time but it was just nice to know that like a band I really like could still make it big and still like have the you know sort of respect of our peers to get something like a Grammy. That part of it. That's what's cool about a Grammy. Yeah. is respect of people that you respect. Yeah, totally. Your peers that that get it. They yeah. get the work. They get the time. What do you think? If any, I mean, do you think there's something special as to why the shakes? I re- mean, reached that status where other bands who were equally as good haven't. I mean, some of it again. It, no matter how good you are, I mean, even like there's people tell these stories about like the Beatles of just like they're ob- they were obviously great, but they also just had a lot of lucky breaks, and the Shakes definitely had that. But when those lucky breaks started happening, they had been a band for like three or four years. Zach and Brittany had been playing together since high school, mm-hmm. and they were when I met them, they were really diligent about you know they got together at least once often twice a week every week to play and to write and they were just really diligent about it so that when the opportunity came right they, they were, were damn good it. well i remembered them as the guys who uh hang on just a second i was trying not to interrupt the phone oh, you're good. i'm you're sorry good. guys i just gotta go cool. and make a bunch of college kids talk about brave new world against their will oh cool <laughs> that'll be fun I mean, I love the book. Yeah, I, too, I think like two of them do. <laughs> All right. I'm going to turn the Kroger light off. You didn't talk about fluorescent lights because everybody in this room, yeah, everybody hates those things. Yeah. We've talked about fluorescents and how much we hate them on every episode. Yeah. I'm going to start calling them Kroger lights now. Yeah. I've not heard them called that, but that's a perfect description. They give me anxiety. I can't yeah, stand I'm it. Saying, I, not I, to mention the noise that I they I get create. made fun of a little bit, but everyone hates them. But like on the road, oh, yeah. if we're like going to a green room or backstage somewhere, I'll start like turning lights off and on, trying to oh, like, God. we can't have the fluorescents on. We gotta, there's gotta be a lamp somewhere. <laughs> Find the right combination of, uh, of of lighting, uh, it's important though, especially it God, is. especially in like a studio. You gotta. Well, they give me anxiety a little bit, and I may not even know it at the time. And I'm just in an ill mood. And I'm like, oh, all in knots, and I'm like, oh, yeah, pff, flip those egg, off. Totally. Okay, cool. Totally. They also give me headaches. I mean, you're burning mercury vapor. Yeah. vapor. That can't be good. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm, I'm probably yeah, gonna have like no telling. light bulb companies writing me and being like, you can't say that. But dude, don't burn mercury. Right. Yeah. So back to the shakes. Yeah. I mean, I think like like I said, when they when the opportunity came, they were ready. You know, they had put in all these hours, and then you know, those guys and and gal are, are like even just the first time I practiced with them, or I guess really the only time I really practiced with them before we started playing shows together it was like they just had a different level of like they were really serious about arrangement. You know, they were really serious about parts. To a level I don't think I'd ever quite seen in other bands I'd played with, like really working it out, like looping the same, just playing the same verse over and over again for a long time while like 
especially where like Heath and Brittany and Zach figured like while well, they figured out guitar parts or once they had that we might do is that be like hey can we just loop that verse forever I want to figure out exactly what I should be doing on bass or like it was just a really like patient focused creative process with them that's a lot to be said for that too because yeah. that's hard yeah, it I mean, is. That is not an easy thing. But they obviously did it just because they liked it. You know, they enjoyed that process. And then, you know, you take all that, and then you've got, I mean, Brittany's just a next level performer. Mm-hmm. She's a really brilliant musician, and she's one of those people that just has that charisma and that energy and that. And it's real. It's not put on. I think that might be the one thing. It's sincere. It, yeah. It's the authenticity of it is something that the music consumers people that just buy and dig and enjoy music were seeking i think so yeah i mean i think that's what happened with downloading and everything too i mean it became more consumer driven which is really good actually because it forced the industry to be like okay people are buying this now we should sell this yeah instead of well we're gonna spoon feed you this right because we can. <laughs> right. I really dig what, what it is that happened with that. It was neat to see it happen because I was assistant manager in a music store in Decatur for like three years. And I remember the guys from Athens would just come over. They would be in town and they'd buy strings and stuff yeah, all the yeah. time. They were always coming in buying strings because I guess they were playing that yeah. much. I think we were probably one of the best places in town that had really good deals on strings. Yeah. So, and we had a Where lot. Where was it? Uh, Emeron, right across okay. from the Princess Theater yeah, in downtown. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Old place that had been there since Moses. Yeah. Yeah, so that that's kind of how... I didn't get to know them like as friends or anything, but I remember them you know, coming yeah. in. With the other bands that you've performed with, you play on a lot of sessions still now. I mean, you got the, the single lot records thing with John Paul White mm-hmm. that was formerly with the Civil Wars and, and uh, Will Trapp. Yeah. So... Tell us a little bit about the single lot. Yeah, that's a lot of my, when the shakes aren't on the road, which this year we haven't been, it's kind of been a pause year and let people raise their babies and that kind of thing. But, yeah. So my day to day is usually more with that. And it, it kind of started with, you know, after I left, I left fame in 2009 and was just doing the freelance thing, pl- playing and touring some, but mostly just engineering sessions and playing on sessions and just, you know, doing whatever. And then kind of just the the short version of it is it kind of just the single lot thing kind of evolved out of conversations that uh i was having with will trap who's one of the like founding partners and and with john paul once he came off the road and we were just talking about all these things like me and john were talking john was wanting to put a little studio behind his house and talking about making some records together and then we were also just talking about what we could do locally to sort of formalize a lot of the relationships that already existed like it was all these bands that always played together and had common members or you know you know so and so from this band sings back sang background on their record or right. they might have co-written together like every it was a very like collaborative this collaborative kind of group of folks and it just seemed like if we could make that a little more like official and formal and like mm-hmm. put a name on it and inject a little bit of money into it so that people weren't having to you know scrape up to record and to you know make compromises about well another day in the studio would be great but my rent's due you know and right. like making those so we, it was never about like let's spend a bunch of money and make a bunch of money it was more like we can spend a little bit of money and help these folks make a better record and them not have to worry about that side of it. And it really did start as kind of just a community focused uh, endeavor that way. And for me, talking going back to us talking about sort of the unpleasantness of having to deal with the financial side of things, it was conscious on my part to put have a little bit more control over the financial part. It, not even really to pay myself more, but to just make sure everyone got paid for their time, myself included, because there was also in that community, and it's just the way it is when everybody's kind of broke, is just like everyone just pays what they can and you pull favors and it's just like trying to make it a little bit more professional and a little bit more consistent. I've been trying to do that. Like I've had a few sessions where I might make a hundred or two hundred dollars or maybe even nothing to make sure the musicians get paid because I'm going to work with those guys again maybe the next week or so. Yeah. And I'm real big on let's pay the musicians before the session ever starts yeah because if we can because the mood changes totally i mean hell you yeah. feed, feed the guys give them <laughs> coffee and pay them 
you know, I had a session here a few months ago where we had agreed on a certain amount and the budget was coming in way less than what I had quoted the artist. So I actually, I made the same. I could have come out making more money, yeah. but I ended up just making what I had agreed on right? and gave them a discount, a happy, happy medium, and gave each of the musicians like an extra $25 yeah. or so. Yeah, yeah. So it was like they were out. That's good karma. Ex- they were <laughs> out like four or $500 less than I had quoted them. But uh, like twenty five dollars more per musician. I, th- I think that stuff really matters. Well, that was gas money and exactly, lunch yeah. for those guys. Right, and everything went quickly. Everybody was happy. It was great. Yeah, like it made my job mixing easier. Yeah, yeah. everything went great. And I didn't, I could have easily just like this is what I quoted and they agreed to it and I could have made a bunch more money. Yeah, but I was just like, but not, you you might have bought, not, you might have bought to do yourself this. yeah, and you might have bought yourself a little like you said it was it was really pleasant and the whole experience experience was easier and more fun. Yeah. And you might, you know, you might have bought yourself some time just by making it easy and right, and right, pleasant. And right. But yeah, I remember you guys talking about there was a, a thing, a talk you guys you and John and Will did at UNA, University of North Alabama, uh, a few years ago where you mentioned that you had three criteria for doing <laughs> a project. Is that still a thing? I mean, yeah, that's something I got from John Paul that he got from somebody else. I mean it's it's kind of a but it's yeah, the the music, the money and the hang are kind well, of Well that really struck a chord oh, with it's, me. It's a very it's a it, it helps because it's a place of like, and the, the rule, the rule you, is you got to get two out of three. Right. It forces you to think about it. Like I'm trying to remember exactly how you worded it. Probably best just to let you describe it. Well, it's like yeah, the, the music, the money, the hang. And if you're getting two out of three, it's worth it's worth taking a gig. And if you're only getting one, it's probably not. So like if the money's great, the money, but the hang sucks. But and but and, you, and the music's not good. Yeah, then, yeah. then maybe not. And let, maybe. but you know sometimes you really need the money, and you just got to bite the bullet and do it but yeah it's kind of like i love their music i love them as people there's no budget then a lot of times it's worth doing or if i love the music the money's going to be solid i don't love hanging out with them but it's worth it creatively right sometimes there's a non-monetary benefit that 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 weighs out to yeah yeah like i think pay more money in the long run sure like i think i think with these people i can make a really great record right it's gonna make the second record it's gonna help it's gonna help yeah yeah. they may have a buddy that they refer you to if you get if you get three out of three i mean like the shakes gig has turned into a three out of three for me where it's like the money's solid they are very good friends they're like family to me and and i love the music so that's kind of that's a home run well i know it's the core three of you guys but reed yeah reed reed watson's the label manager and is actually now he's he's coming in as a as a partner yeah, as I knew well. he was heavily involved i didn't know his exact position yeah his, his so. like his title is label manager which really means he he runs the the ship day to day so what's he, everybody's role i mean you're obviously a musician engineer, it kind of changes i mean like will's primary role is like is more on the business and financial end like he kind of put in the initial capital to start the thing and then he's also the person who's way more versed in sort of the business side of things mm-hmm. and and he's kind of He's nice to have around because he's his background isn't in the music business, and so sometimes he can ask right. the obvious questions of things, or just like, well, why why do people do it that way? And then it's just like, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> right? They, they just do, uh, you know. It's like there's so much of that conventional wisdom that right. with this with an industry that changes so much every day that the conventional wisdom can become unwise pretty quickly. But and then John Paul and I primarily on the like the production side which he and I will co-produce a lot and then some stuff I'll do on my own so the studio side of things and the production side is, is me and him and then for me I wear a lot of different hats and it's like if I'm not actively in the studio on a given day working on something it's kind of like a catch-all where I'm like kind of sometimes I'm helping read on kind of the label management stuff like doing basic project management stuff sort of like making sure our artwork's coming in you know making sure manufacturing's on schedule all that stuff because he's only we have a couple of other full-time employees but he he's it, it kind of all rests with him and so when there's a lot going on i'll kind of pick up the slack where i can and then mm-hmm. yeah it's kind of day to day and week to week my job if you want to call it that uh, it, my role definitely shifts and changes just based on what we've got coming up so like early next year we'll have like a caleb elliott record coming and then oh, a new, cool. and then a new john paul record after that 
and we'll have South by. So like after the new year, a big part of that, that will be like planning and executing South by Southwest and getting all that together. And that's like, that's, that's a big organizational and logistical job. That's not, it's not really in anyone's job description. (laughs) So so we all kind of help wrangle that. So yeah, it really changes depending on where we are in like a record cycle and and where, when we're putting stuff out and leading up to a record release, things can, you know, there's, there's a lot to be done. And sometimes that just means an all hands on deck. Right. Um, well, let me ask you this. I mean, as far as like scouting talent, what are, what are your philosophies on that? Do you, know, you just kind of do you actively do that, not or do you really. just kind of like go see bands as a fan? And yeah, I mean, if for, you really for dig us, it, we're we, you know we're we're a small operation, and so in years past, we've really put out no more than like three or four records in a year. But this year, we put out six. Which was a lot, and we'll probably put out less next year because it was it was a lot to tackle. I'm I'm glad we put out everything we put out, but that is a lot. We kind of found ourselves bumping against the ceiling of how many records can we put out and and do it well. I mean, we could put out fifty and do it bad, <laughs> but right. Um, but what good would that do? Yeah, exactly. To to really give every every record its due. For us as a company, most of the records we've put out and all the artists, it's been like really really organic. Like, yeah. Well, you guys have done a lot of you've done a lot of engineering and studio. B with the guys mm-hmm. at Portside yeah, Sound. Yeah. They've got a cool setup, great yeah, guys. Yeah, I love it. So that's been part of the projects you guys have put out over the past year, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the Mia Dyson record was like all cut in there. The Caleb Elliott record that's coming, about half of it was cut in there. Um, mm-hmm. The rest of it was done at at, at our at Sundrop is what we call our studio, but it's just at mine and John Paul's studio. Um, um, probably due to John's obsession with Sundrop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's been cool. Like, yeah, we have our own place, and some records we work on, we'll do them there, top to bottom. It'll be the only studio, but it's a pretty unique advantage here where it's like there's port side yeah, there's a lot there's of great fame, studios there's like jackson highways back open now there's the nut house it's like depending on the project right. you can kind of like know oh we should take it this for this record yeah we should go cut it at the nut house or even i've done records where it's like with john paul's record we went and cut on the last record and the upcoming one we went and cut specific songs at fame right it's just like john's every every solo record he's made at least part of it's been done at fame it's just right. like well we should keep that up like okay which songs right so like picking specifically oh this these songs could use a big room you know right. and that kind of vibe uh which is really fun you know to be in such a small town and have a variety of like really great rooms that are all affordable they're all different too they're Completely all they're different. all different different gear different rooms different well, strengths it's, it's onto the gear side of things what's your take on gear i mean <laughs> it's like when you use really good stuff it does get easier like That's get true. like getting good sounds and like it's sounding like music and it's it like so it definitely I don't want to say it doesn't matter because it, it it does you it, you can with, just get there quicker. so much quicker and easier yeah. like I cut a record in Austin earlier this year at, at Arlen and they've got this old they've got a it's not really a the console doesn't have a proper model number because they've done this weird custom console thing but it's a discrete neve and it's got the clicky neve preamps and it's just like i pulled up one overhead like an overhead through that thing and it just already sounded like a drum sound i love you know? when that happens it's just like man and they, everything was kind of like that which is like, when you have great players especially yeah. drummers that tune their drums right it was that and too yeah you got a great room and but, it's like well there okay cool there's the record you I, know i am of the opinion with with gear like what happens in front of a microphone or what happens in a musician's hands and brain is infinitely more important than what comes after it. Amen to that. Like, I'd rather have an inspired performance with a 57 and a 002 than oh, yeah. the greatest, you know, a $50,000 chain. But what's happening in front of it, it isn't anything great, then then what's the point? Yeah, exactly. I've, I've had that conversation with a friend here a couple days ago, actually, where I was making the point, it was like, look, you can have the best song in the world, best performers in the world, best gear in the world. Of course, that's going to sound great. You can have the crappy song, crappy performance, best gear, best room, and it's going to sound like garbage. Yeah. You can have a great song and a great performance on a cell phone. Yeah. And it's going to emotionally connect yeah. to a listener. Totally. I mean, we geek out on gear, but I think it's just for the same reason that mechanics geek out on their favorite tools. Sure, or, yeah, yeah. Because that's what they are for us. They're tools. I mean, you know, they 
use a certain brand of sockets, and uh-huh. there's a reason for that. And there's a reason behind why we do what we do and the tools we choose to use, obviously. I mean, like a painter, you know, will geek out on types of brushes and canvases and, right. and paints and all of that stuff for days. It's just, you know, it's a different – the microphones are our paintbrushes, you know. It's, yeah, yeah. You know, they have color to the sound, but at the end of the day, it's the music and the performance that matters, yeah. the song. And yeah. I fully agree with that. Yeah, the, the tricky thing. It's hard it, to remember that sometimes. It is. Actually. It is. And the, the tricky thing that the, you got to balance as far as like in, in an actual session is know, knowing when, like, there's plenty of times somebody's doing, if somebody's doing something cool and you think it could sound better or you think you maybe I should switch that mic. It's like, but, man, what they're doing is cool. I don't want to interrupt it. I've been Ver- in that exact versus, situation. But then, then sometimes it's like, hey, we really got to fix that. <laughs> like, yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, you have to strike it's, that it's balance. Gonna be, it's going to be worth it to switch this mic out. But, yeah, uh, yeah that's just uh, – and that's one of those things that just comes with doing it yeah. for hours and hours and hours and knowing – I'm going to I'm going to wish later I'd switch that mic or right. or it's not going to matter. Right, at the same time. Yeah. It'll make it sound fine. I hate five. to say fix it in the mix, but right. you, I can fix this in the mix. Sure. That, that, versus a, versus I can't. Yeah. You know, it's like it's it's one of those phrases that I loathe sure. to hear people say and I almost don't want to say it, but at the same time it's kind of like I can put a little EQ or something on that yeah, yeah. and boost or cut this versus I'm going to interrupt a performance that may not ever happen again. Right. That's, you know, a record is a record of time. Right. You know, and that, it, it, we, I might have totally screwed that up and missed it. Yeah. If I interrupt that by trying to do something that no one really could yeah. care about right. you know, except me. It'll never sound wrong to anybody else. Right. On the topic of gear, what's your favorite console? That's a tough one, I know. I mean, I like the. It's. I mean, it's. They're. In, I'll never have one, probably, because they're insanely expensive. But like, yeah, the the discrete Neves, like, like the, the ones that the eighty series, yeah. or, the, or like the 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 they're like fifty three and fifty four series ones that are a little bit later than that. Ones with the click pots on. Them. Yeah, if they've yeah. got usually if they've got a clicky pre or or a clicky EQ, those are those are kind of incredible. Like I said, they just kind of do the job for you, and you don't have to. Th- I don't know, got to think a lot less. <laughs> it's yeah. like it kind of already sounds. It automatically sounds good. Well, what's and, your go to? I mean, at this point, for like say a vocal chain, what's your favorite vocal mic? I mean, I know that's a that's a broad question because it depends on the singer and the song. Yeah, but like, what are your top three that you have ready to go? That I have ready to go yeah. in our studio because I don't have like I mean, the, on the occasion where I'm places with a crazy mic locker and have access to like a, an an old forty seven or sixty seven, right? Those are sweet, but I don't have ten grand to drop right. on I'm mics. I'm with you on that. But I've you know I'll usually do. I've got an old. The poor man's version of that. I've got an old Neumann CMV like bottle mic with an M7 capsule. Oh, that's cool. So it's it's kind of a poor man's 47. That kind of sounds good on everybody. Well, that's what I've got here is the Ocean Way Sterling oh, cool. Audio. Yeah, they don't claim it's a FET 47. They say it's a Class A FET mic. Got this you, thing's yeah. a FET 47. Right. None um, of them are exact anyway. If you put two next to each other. But, but I tell you, I mean, an SM7 is kind of incredible. Just yeah, that's what you're using now. Uh, yeah, the SM7B. Uh, I'm but. sure. I'm sure I sound great. <laughs> uh, Those are awesome. They mics, work, man. man. Like that's. There's a lot of singers I've worked with that they sound best on that. And yeah, I found um, that to be true too. And then I've also got a. I've got an old, an older 414. That's. It doesn't have. Is it, it the silver one or? Yeah, the, it's an EB. Oh it's man, it's a silver EB. Those are hard to come by. And it's got a. And when I got it, it was cheap. Um, they're not now. They're not now. It's crazy because oh, I thought because I got it. It's a 414EB, so it's got the same. If I'm not mistaken, it's got a same or similar capsule to like a C12. Yeah, but it just it's solid state and it's got a Teflon ring mm-hmm. instead of a brass ring. Like the ones with the brass ring get a lot more expensive. But it's a very neutral. It just sounds nice. It sounds kind of boring. But in a really good, pleasant way, where it's like, if something sounds good, if you put that in front of it, it's gonna sound like the thing. And but it also like takes EQ really well, and mm-hmm. so it's like that with a really good chain kind of can fool you into thinking it's something a lot fancier than it is. So, what's your uh, favorite compressor right now? Oh man, 
I mean, I've got an, I've got one of those retro stay levels, like the reissue, the gates, like reissue of a stay level, which is probably my favorite right now, just because it everything sounds good through it. And it's a weird. It's just got an input and an output, and then a couple. It, but you can't change the speed. It's just got like a. Well, you can change the the release time, but it's one of those like it's just got an in and an out and. Especially if you don't really look at it, if you don't really look at what the meter's doing, and just kind of like dial the in and out until it sounds good. Like you can, you can really like squash something, mm-hmm. and it sounds great. It's weird. It's like, but it doesn't sound. Is it kind of operating a little like a tube tech? Kinda. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Because um, those it's you got can a pretty little well more, slam, and yeah. they don't sound. Ironically, don't sound tuby. Yeah, that's probably my favorite at the moment of stuff I've got in the rack. Okay, so drums. What are your thoughts on mic and drums? I've gotten I, to where I love mono over I, right I, I, I tend to be fairly minimal. Like I've almost always got a Coles forty thirty eight as as like the mono overhead. Do you ever mic hi hats? Rarely. If I do, it's usually like a fifty seven. Yeah, I'll do or like or a, a ribbon. Yeah, I'll, if if it's something where the hi hat like really needs more than often than not, if I, I'm the only reason I'm micing it is if I want to pan. Mm-hmm. The hi hat. If I don't want it all up the middle, and I feel like it ought to pan off, or if the drummer's doing something particularly interesting on the hi hat, it's like a kind of an odd hi hat part. I mm-hmm. might, but it's usually it's usually like a D twelve on kick. Sometimes not the D one twelve. No, the D twelve, the square an, one. Yeah, um, you got original or a reissue mm-hmm. of it's that? It's an it's an old one. Oh man, those are great. It's sweet. And it, but it, you know, depending on sometimes if you want something with a little more like attack or punch, I I'll, I'll might use like an RE20 or a 421, mm-hmm. just depending. So sometimes it's that. Snares usually uh, like a Bear Dynamic 201. Oh, really? But I'll use a 57 or, you know. I've been using this uh, SE V7 yeah. lately on snares. It sounds yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Like, I go through phases of different yeah. things. And then, yeah, that Coles as the overhead. But toms, you know, depending on the drummer, I, I tend to really like the way the toms sound when they're tuned well, just through the overhead. So not even, yeah, yeah, like yeah. not even a tom mic. Some t- if it's something really where I really want to make like the floor tom, especially get like big, or they're really like riding the floor tom or something. I might put something on there, which could well, be like a like 421. Reed, for instance, is a fantastic drummer with incredible control of his dynamics. Yeah, so yeah. you really don't even have to. Yeah, totally. You could probably put an overhead up and be good. Yeah, yeah. Like that. And I've done I've done uh, some things that are just a kick in an overhead and yeah. say it sounds good. To, and but then I'll do like I might depending on where I am and I might throw up some room mics. I, I mean, usually I have at least something just in case. But yeah. what's your thoughts on processing drums? I mean, like compression, especially like overheads uh, and toms and things. Especially if I'm, I'll usually have. A, like kind of light compression on everything because I've kind of gone I went for a while where I was putting zero compression on the overheads and I was compressing all the individual I've done drums. that yeah and then I went complete opposite where I was crushing the overheads and not compressing yeah. any of the other drums I'll rarely and, and it's been this I've gotten good results both ways sure but it's it's definitely a different thing but I've kind of come to the realization I think it's just it fully depends on the drums, the song, the singles, totally. the drummer, yeah, yeah, everything yeah. is case by um, case. Yes, yeah, so I like typically in tracking, I'll, I'll have some compression on like kick and snare with like a distressor or something, but not doing a lot. I love those. I wish like I just had kinda, one. Just kind of catching it. And then usually the overhead kind of same, like moderate compression, but then... Yeah, it's like song to song. Sometimes it it starts to really feel good if I just start crushing stuff. And do you ever worry much about phase? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that's part of why I like the minimal, like the less mics thing. You see, I've not ever really run into much trouble with it. I guess yeah. that's I guess that's why. Yeah, yeah. Especially like at our old studio where we t- usually cut the drums. It was just it was a small, pretty smallish room, mm-hmm. and if if you had like one or two mics going, it would sound really good. And the more mics you kind of introduced, it's just there's a lot of stuff bouncing around. Well, that's the reason I've had my drums mic'd the way they are in here. Yeah. Is one, you know, just a mono overhead. Because if I had two, I've got too much bleed. Yeah. And that's two mics. Right. But I've got to deal with a bunch of bleed. Right. And then you've got reflections. And, and that, yeah, yeah, just the one mic would be closer to the wall. Right. It would just make it, it all weird. Yeah, and, exactly. 
and they're not going to sound remotely the same at all. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I know folks who are really good at this sort of, you know, throwing a dozen mics on a drum kit and, and getting it sounding good, and it's all in phase. And I think if you're in a bigger room, that's a little easier. But I've just always been happier with doing the quick and dirty. And then I'll usually, I've got a couple just weirdo mics that I'll usually throw either like on the floor mm-hmm. under the kit or, or some spot like that. And that's just sort of an oddball, like distortion, lo-fi kind of thing. That's that always some, fun. If you sometimes it gets channels. used. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it doesn't get used. Sometimes it just gets tucked in. Sometimes it becomes like the feet, you know, a big part of the sound. I find doing things like that that are a little left of center for anybody that's an artist or a band, it's like, yo, he's, they get excited about totally. that thing. Yeah. Like we had, um, I had a bluegrass session at a, in Corinth. A guy has a real nice studio in his basement and he had this old Marlboro mic and I hung it in the stairwell. Yeah. I ended up not using it, but everybody was excited no, about it. No, it does a thing. Yeah. Just psychologically with yeah, everybody. It's like, oh, we're being creative. Yeah. 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 And so it's, it's, they loosen up a little. Yeah. It's like, oh, he's, he's not afraid to try something. Not so afraid I to can try be something. Free to try something he cares. Yeah. He cares. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All that. That, that's a big deal is I've been been in studios before where it's just like you feel like the engineer's looking at their watch totally and it's like dude i'm paying you <laughs> it's yeah. like do you not love this because i love this exactly you know, yeah. it's like Same. we should all be geeking out here yeah but it's like you know that in, in studios where it feels like a dentist office it's just too clinical it's like yeah. oh, i can't touch anything you know right and i'm totally have tried to go the exact opposite of that Same, for what i yeah. do because that's not why i'm in it Right. Jim, what's some advice you would give somebody who's trying to do what it is you do? I mean, and maybe they're engineering and a little bit at home or whatever yeah. with a little interface and a, a mic and keyboard and a little Pro Tool setup or something and play guitar or keys and yeah. not really sure how to get into playing with bands or how to how to do any of it. Or maybe they're doing a little bit of it but not really sure where it's leading. I mean, you're never going to be sure where it's leading. That's kind of exciting. It can be. Yeah, totally. Scary. It's exciting and terrifying. You know, I think especially at that beginning stage, it's like make yourself open to all sorts of opportunities and say yes to as much as you possibly can. I, I find that some people, when they're starting out, Especially if they have like friends or peers who who are like who do it professionally, they might get a little bit ahead of themselves of thinking like, well, I can't do it unless I'm getting paid X, or you know, I I can't do it unless the budget is this. And she's like, well, you haven't you haven't earned that yet. I think right. you know if if you as and that goes for musicians or engineers or whatever. But it's like if you if you really want to do this, I mean, the best thing you can do is create a reputation for yourself that you're that, that you're good at it and that you you care and that you're a decent person to be around. And I feel like if you if you work hard and push yourself and treat other people decently, you'll you'll find a way. But it's it takes time. You just got to kind of put in those hours, and there's really no no substitute for putting in the hours and push yourself, try to get better in any way you can. And then, yeah, it's easier said than done, but it's like try to find like-minded people to work with and just be like, hey, let's make, you know, let's make something. I mean, sort of the, the joy and magic of, of making something, whether it's by yourself or with other people, you can't really lose sight of that. It's just like if you get good enough at making something, then you then you might be able to get somebody to pay you to help them make something. Mm-hmm. But you, you can't lose sight of the initial thing that, that made you want to do it in the first place. It's easy to, to lose sight of it, it too, oh, totally. because when you're putting in the hours and the work, you can, yeah, you can get fried. It can, it can get, you can, you can reach a point of burnout, which I did. Yeah. I got burnout. I found myself saying, trying to juggle life. I found myself, oh man, I don't want to go to the studio today. And then I immediately yeah, was yeah. like, totally. That that just came out of my mouth. Yeah. And I'm like, holy crap, really? You got to find things that once you do get to that point where you're you're you have gigs and you are busy and it's and which is really lucky to be in that space but you still got to find I find myself doing it. you've got to find projects or just something to 
that that is just fun. Like, let's just I do it. I fully yeah. agree. That's true. Let's Look, do this thing. Money doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter if it goes anywhere. Right. We're just having fun and enjoying it. Let's and make, yeah, make some make some noise, make some sounds. That's a really and, good point. Because, you, and sometimes that's the stuff that hits. Yeah, well, yeah, sometimes it is. Yeah. Because your guard's down. You're not thinking about it. Right. And you're willing to try things you may not try before. Yeah. You know, like talking about doing a weird mic thing, crushing it in compression. Or right. Distorting it or something. You might not do that when you're trying to be safe for, right. say, a demo or, or, session. Or doing it for some, you know, some, for someone else that's paying for it. Right, exactly. So kind of on that same vein leads me to ask this. Are there things that are non-musical that you feel like help you keep a level head and keep your head in the game and keep a balance in your life? Yeah. I mean, especially once we started the label... Once we started single lock and I was doing that and I was on the road a lot with the shakes, kind of like like 2013, 14, got really difficult at times and took me a while of just learning like time management, which was everything from, I mean, I still have like a a very elaborate Google calendar. Oh, thank thank you to the Google (laughs) calendar gods. Seriously. Uh, My life would. Yeah, I don't, I really don't know what I would do. I don't know. Yeah. It would not work, <laughs> but it was also it was also that and 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 giving myself the learning things like once I got to a certain level of busyness where I would like have to schedule days off, like put it on the calendar, like this is a day off. Like if I had, do you have specific days or no, times, or do you just no? It's not really. It's really just whenever there's a hole on the calendar. Um, That's if, something. If I'm super busy, where it's like okay, I'm, I'm in a session for two weeks and then we're going on this tour and then I'm back and it's like, hey, there's a day right here. I just need to, that needs to stay open for my sanity and, and well-being. Or or if I'm, yeah, if, if uh, find, giving myself the time sometimes, like if a, if a session ends early or something, just going home. <laughs> and, I, I've struggled uh, with that here recently, yeah. actually. That's, that's uh, partly why I ask that question. You got to work hard to get anywhere in anything, but especially in this business, like you got to, you got to push yourself and you got to work hard. And then it's kind of like once you get for, for me, at least and speaking from my own experience, once you get to a certain place in order to keep doing it for a long period of time, for like years and years, you've got to find for yourself strategies to like, get rest and not you can't push yourself that hard forever or you'll you'll break down yeah or at I, least did. I, I have and a guy who was a former client who was unbeknownst to me i didn't know at the time was on meth was tell, <laughs> was telling me and you probably know who i'm talking about but not gonna name names but he told me he's like dude you're gonna have to slow down you're gonna end up sick yeah. that was a meth head telling me to slow down <laughs> and i'm like i wasn't on drugs never yeah. done drugs i was on a lot of coffee yeah which a pot pot and a half of coffee a day yeah is not healthy no i've been there (laughs) but i mean that was really a slap in the face to me it was like i was going you know sometimes two three days without sleep or maybe sleeping 45 minutes or two hours here and there Uh i had lost the ability to sleep past four hours wow and it just i was getting sick yeah it was like i'm chasing this dream so hard you know yeah yeah you know it's a hobby job quote unquote and it's like no one's gonna ever tell me i don't work hard or i don't have a real job yeah yeah and that's all that's all that's really important I had to take a step back, but then, though. Yeah, eventually because, you do have to. I mean, to, I'm all about the hustle fun. and going for it, but at the same time, and I'm proud of what I accomplished in that amount of time. However, it's good to find some balance. Yeah, one of my favorite authors, John Acuff, I've, I've said this a lot on the podcast, hustle is an act of focus, not frenzy. And That's good. That, that wow. That's something I've had post-it notes everywhere because my life was a frenzy. Yeah. It was like being everything to everybody and everywhere all the time is not healthy. And my mixes yeah. got dull because I felt dull. I would have to come back in and fix things. It would take longer for me to finish projects. Yeah. And I lost my joy and excitement about it there for a little moment and was like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm doing a thing that people, you know, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. This is a, so you can get burnout. I thought I knew what burnout was till I experienced it. Sure. And you have to have rest. If you want to be on your A game all the time, you've got to have rest. And 
Yeah, I learned that the hard way. I'm just glad I learned it. Yeah. When a, when a meth head tells you to slow down, <laughs> that's it's yeah. Pretty, you got You can. It's pretty you can kind bad. of find your find your wall or find your ceiling, and then you kind of know where it is and try to learn from it. When you have your scheduled day off, let's say a project that's kind of a dream project comes up, how do you handle that? Do you? Oh, I just do it. Do you, you do it? But but <laughs> yeah. like, do you immediately say, okay, I've got to schedule another day off, or uh, it's, how, it's, how do you handle that? I mean, like, what's the? Do you have a rule with yourself where it's like I'm not going to fill this day with work unless it meets X sure, criteria. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's nothing. It's nothing super specific, but yeah, if it's like if I see on the calendar I'm working for the next 15 days or something, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Just making up a number. But if I'm if I've got a lot going on or I'm, I have a lot of travel or any of that, and I can see at the end of it. There's an open day that doesn't look like it's going to be filled. Yeah, and so then if somebody inquires about something, it's usually not a deal breaker. It's, it's you know it's like kind of like hey, can we start on Tuesday? And and everyone's usually fine with that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and well, I mean, given, honestly, given if day. they're wanting you, they want the best you. We're exactly. Too. Exactly. So usually, I found here recently that if I'm just straight with people, they're like, yeah, cool. Totally. Same kind of thing. Totally. Because they're like, oh, yeah, we don't want you to, to be sucking. We're not yeah. going to pay you to do a halfway job. We want you on your best. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, man, thank you again. Yeah, man. Appreciate your time. It was nice. And this has been this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, man. So, we've had plenty of coffee. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we're awake now. So, you, yay. Okay, that we, I overdid that. I'm not that awake. Okay. I don't think I've ever been that awake in my entire life. Anyway, Ben Tanner, part two. You had to leave during this interview. But I did. I had to uh, had to go administer a final. We ended up splitting this into two parts because uh, Ben was gracious enough to spend a lot of time with us and for us to pick his brain. Thanks again to Ben. Thanks to you, our listeners. We're on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Leave us a review and a rating, as always. We're also on everything that you want to listen on. We're on all the streaming platforms. We're working on getting on Pandora. Which is new to us. That is new. Well, I mean, if you're listening to this, hey, guys, you should know that we're recording this like seven months ahead of time. So if you're listening to this, there's a chance you are listening to it on Pandora. Ah! In which case, hey, excellent. Let us know how you did that. Yeah. Let us know what you like to listen on. That would help us. uh, What your favorite platform is and why. We do have a Patreon, and on that Patreon, you'll find bloopers, you'll find outtakes, you'll find occasionally things that that did not make it into the interview, either because, you know, some of these platforms, they do have a limited amount of time that can be uploaded, so sometimes things just don't make it, and then sometimes Grant and I act a fool, and something has to be edited out. You gotta have fun. But, hey, I mean, you know, if you even want to throw, like, a dollar a month at us on Patreon, you know, that really helps us. If nothing else, hey, it buys us a cup of coffee, and I, I mean, I'll never say no to a cup of coffee. Unless it's a really bad coffee. Uh, yeah, unless it's just an absolutely terrible. Even then, I'll probably. I've been known it. to microwave two-day-old coffee. I did it this morning, and I'm not proud. Thanks again to all of our listeners. We very much appreciate you guys. Again, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if it weren't for you. We would just be two guys sitting here staring at each other. You're beautiful, but. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh. You should. Oh, good, though. This found it. Yep. Be sure to tell all of your friends. We have some more really cool interviews coming up, so be sure to stick around. And don't forget, patreon.com forward slash tape noise podcasts. Onward and upward. Peace. <laughs>